I, when reading some of your research, I thought it was super fascinating to name the behavioral immune system. I think everybody has a general idea of what the immune system is, but specifically the behavioral immune system. And um, it was really interesting to think about how you've been doing this work prior to COVID and now here's a huge experiment. Um, so I guess if you could just talk a little bit about like what the behavioral immune system is and then maybe some of the, the research and work that you've done around that topic. Yeah, sure. So the behavioral immune system is, uh, I'll start out by stressing something about it that, that, um, that people don't always actively pay attention to. And that is behavioral immune system is an idea. It's not a thing that is inside our, our bodies or our heads. It's an idea. And so in some sense, it's an analogy, right? So we know about this physiological immune system that we have, right? Which is an incredibly complex set of processes that uh, are designed to uh, address pathogens and other kinds of things that get into the body, right? Um, and there's a lot of ways that those get addressed once they're in the body. And so there's a lot of different processes involved there. It's not just a single system. It's a system of a lot of things. Um, but the, the major downside of the physiological immune system is, well, there's multiple. I mean, it takes a lot of energy. Um, it can cause a lot of collateral damage. Uh, so it turns out a lot of, like, for instance, the side effects of, of um, you know, getting a vaccination or uh, many diseases are actually the harms that we get from those are a lot of times actually due to our immune system, not due to the disease itself. Our immune system just goes crazy. And so it causes collateral damage. But the big picture problem with the physiological immune system is that for it to do anything effective, you have to get infected. So those germs have to get inside. Uh, and obviously that's a risky proposition, right? Because who knows what's gonna happen. Uh, and so the idea of the behavioral immune system is to think about, okay, is it possible that there is a psychology of infection or psychology of infectious disease, pathogens, parasites, et cetera, that could potentially help people to avoid that initial infection in the first place? Um, and if so, is it something that we just had to learn through the advent of modern medicine? Like, you know, once we know germ theory, do we now have to just get trained in how to do this stuff? Or is it possible that uh, we have an evolved behavioral immune system? That is, that we've been, you know, over the course of our species history, have we been using aspects of our psychology to keep us safe from potential uh, pathogenic dangers that exist out there? So the, that's, that's the idea of what the behavioral immune system is. And it involves a lot of things. It involves like thinking about certain kinds of situations and certain kinds of people as potentially being bad or um, threats uh, at the level of germs. Um, it involves certain kinds of emotions. Oftentimes the, the biggest one is disgust. So thinking about how people react with disgust, disgust seems to be particularly tied towards keeping things out of the body. Um, and other kinds of behaviors that people use to um, not always top of mind keep them safe from infection, but engage in ways that actually do functionally help them to not become infected. So we study a lot of those various aspects of this behavioral immune system. Again, thinking about potentially this idea that this is something that is, to some extent, largely evolved. Uh, and um, the thinking around that is, well, you can look to see in, uh, you know, across cultures, uh, people are doing oftentimes very similar types of thinking and feeling and behaviors in the context of pathogen threats. And you can look across species at other, at other um, animal species, insect species, and so on, that do very similar kinds of activities to protect themselves from, from illness and or infection. And because of that, we, you, know, it's, you can potentially say that this is probably something, to some extent anyway, that has a, a large evolutionary component to it. That it's adaptive for the kinds of environments we would have we would have uh, existed in for long periods of time. So we study things like um, everything from visual attention. So what do people pay attention to when they're concerned about disease? Um, are they looking at specific kinds of people? Do they are they orienting towards specific kinds of threats? Because if you think about attention, well, pathogens are pretty much invisible. 
And so you're not gonna be able to walk around and say, hey, there's the disease, there's the disease, uh, there's the germ. You know, there's some exceptions to that if you think about things like parasitic worms. So some of those you can see. Um, but uh, typically what you're looking at is the symptoms of infection in either other people. So do they show things that look potentially abnormal or that we naturally associate with potential disease or other kinds of substances like food? So contaminants in food, uh, are, is there mold, does it smell bad? All of those kinds of sensory properties can suggest something about whether there's harm, potential risk there. So we study visual attention, um, like how people, what, what are the features in people's faces that we, pay, we look at. Um, we have uh, done some recent work on sound and thinking about how people pay attention to like coughs and sneezes in others. Um, we've done a lot of this work on sensory properties and the idea is or sensory information. And the reason for that is because that's a big place where we get this kind of information about what kinds of germs exist out there in the world. Now, the other place we get it is from, we can call it conceptual information. And that's basically just like learning about what you know, experts say, what the media says, uh, and, and so on. Um, and that type of information intersects with this idea of the behavioral immune system and can trigger it. So cause people to act in ways that um, where they become more averse to, to risks. But it doesn't always tend to be as strong, which I think suggests that the sensory information, which is probably more in line with the kind of evolved aspect of the behavioral immune system. We would, we would have had access to like sight and sound and smell you know, across our species history. We wouldn't have had access to like uh, CNN or something across our species history. And so because of that, I think we're really tuned to the sensory information more than just the, the learned kind of conceptual information. Um, so we try to understand if people are actively concerned about disease, how do they change their thinking? How do they change their feelings? How do they change their behaviors? Or if they live in um, places in the world where there is more pathogens. So uh, if you live closer to the equator where it's hotter and wetter, there, you know, it's a breeding, more of a breeding ground for different kinds of germs. And people actually get infected more frequently than if you live closer to the poles. And so because of that, we might expect that there's more of these kind of behavioral immune behaviors in those places where people get infected more frequently because they have to deal with this problem more. Um, that's one, one hypothesis. And then the last piece that we've done a little bit of work on, and people are just starting to really get into this more, is the intersection between the behavioral immune system and the physiological immune system. So um, if you think about like some people's, you know, internal physiological immune systems work really well, and some people's don't work as well. Um, and that can be due to certain kinds of conditions like autoimmune diseases or being recently sick, perhaps, or using immunosuppressant drugs, those kinds of things. Now, the behavioral immune system could potentially help out in those cases where people's uh, physiological immune system doesn't work quite as well. And so we started to try to study, is that the case? Are these things complementing each other in some type of way by looking at uh, immune functioning in, in, in parallel with the behavioral side, side of things? So that's a very um, long-winded way of talking about the, what the behavioral immune system is. Yeah, no, but it, I, it was so informative. Um, and I'm curious about like positive consequences that can come from it. Obviously you can maybe averse some of these more dangerous situations to where you don't want to contract this pathogen, but uh, like, what are also some negative consequences, especially with like COVID now, I know that there's probably a heightened behavioral immune system amongst a lot of people, but not amongst everybody. Um, but yeah, what, what could those look like? Yeah, so this is a big, big focus, this idea of the negative consequences of, of behavioral immune system. And the reason is kind of going back to that idea that you can't see pathogens. All you can see are symptoms of, of infection of other people, or sometimes you don't even see symptoms. So like with, with COVID, you might not see symptoms at all. Um, and so what can you rely on to suggest that somebody might be uh, an infection risk? Well, you can rely on other kinds of heuristic cues that people present. So um, for instance, have you been around them recently? Do you know them uh, is a simple cue. And if you've been around people and you know them well, then perhaps they're going to be less of an infection risk um, because you, if you've, especially if you've been around them, because you probably would have already gotten sick if they were infected. Uh, and so this idea of paying attention to cues, like 
how familiar is this person? Are they part of my group? Um, do they engage in behaviors that, uh, that you find unusual? Um, because we know that, so for instance, social norms are a big aspect of psychology. And the social norms that we have, sometimes we can think about them as, oh, it's just weird that this culture does one thing and this other culture does another thing. We can think about them as just sort of unique uh, aspects of culture, but they also might be to some extent solutions, functional solutions to manage the environment. And so some social norms can help people to prevent infection in places where infection is relatively high. And so if you see somebody who's not following the social norm, you might think, hey, that person is, there's something weird about them and I better stay away from them. So the kinds of, because of that, because of all of that, what you end up finding is that people who are concerned about disease, whether that's just part of their personality or whether they're actively thinking about it, they tend to, um, they pay attention to those cues more, those cues that are, you know, whether somebody's familiar to you or not actually doesn't probably set, tell you that much about whether they're sick. Um, it might have no relevance at all but people pay attention to it and they act on it. So they, what you see is that people become more avoidant uh, of people who possess cues. Um, and it could be that familiarity, it could be other kinds of things. Like for instance, we've done some work on um, benign physical abnormalities, like having a birthmark on your face um, has nothing to do, or a scar has nothing to do with infection threat, but people treat it as though it's infection threat because it looks abnormal. Um, and at some low level, they're not really thinking through this idea of like, oh, it's really a risk to me. It's just like, no, just get away. So that you get more avoidant of people. You see people express thought patterns that are uh, related to avoidance, like prejudice. So um, prejudices against certain groups of people, um, typically groups of people that you might already associate with uh, infection risk or um, groups of people that are just like different than you. And so that's a, so when people are you know, concerned about disease, you see increased levels of prejudice uh, around there. And so we see that a lot these days with COVID um, and the kind of uh, whether it's, you know, within country prejudice or whether it's nationalistic kinds of prejudices. Um, and a lot of those are probably spilling out because of these, these kinds of consequences of behavioral immune uh, functioning, in addition to you know, other things that are going on in, in society. Um, so there's, there's those kinds of negative consequences. Um, and then you could think about other types of, of negative things that aren't as social. So for instance, people could, who are really worried about germs, they often will also do things to, to try to manage their environment in ways that keep it looking orderly um, or, or clean. I mean, we have to learn what clean means, but um, that can go too far, right? So people could become um, very, you know, obsessed with that kind of behavior, and that's they could uh, that could change how they interact with other people. Um, so it can lead people to sometimes even, you know, spend less time with their social networks and more time managing the cleanliness of their environment. You could think about extreme forms like OCD uh, as connected to this this kind of a, a behavior as well.